joining us. We are recording this. Perfect. Welcome to the Rural Resiliency Forum today. We're really looking forward to this discussion um, and especially for chat with our, our special guest here, State Representative Norlin Momsen. Um, thank you, Representative, for joining us from the Capitol. Can you tell us a little bit about how your day is going and, and where you're <laughs> from? Well, it's been busy so far trying to make had to make sure the, the Zoom and everything was working. I didn't want to uh, not be able to participate. A um, little background, um, I, I, I farm when I'm not here, raise corn and beans and have a, a basically feed cattle or have a feedlot. Um, that's my full-time job. And then I'm, this is my eighth year in the legislature. Uh, and I'm, uh, when I came, I thought I was gonna be mainly agriculture stuff, but that got changed real fast. So I've been involved in a lot of things, but I, I, my base is still agriculture. Um, I'm on the Ag Committee and the Natural Resources Committee, and then on Appropriations and Transportation, and the Chair of the Ag and Natural Resources Appropriations Committee. So I still have my base in agriculture, but in, still involved in a lot of the other uh, activities here at the Capitol. So that's a quick background on me. Excellent. Well, thank you. And those are certainly topics we'll dive right into <laughs> today, and, and topics important to us at the Center as well. Um, just to give you a very brief overview of the center um, for everybody here and maybe those who are less familiar, we are a nonpartisan nonprofit established over 45 years ago, and it's our mission to support rural communities and promote vibrant rural communities. And we do that, uh, especially working with family farms, new business owners and, and small businesses and rural communities and kind of approaching that question from a number of angles of, of vibrant rural communities. And so we're really excited today to talk about rural resiliency, what that looks like in your district and in your area of Iowa uh, representative and just kind of getting uh, some of that feedback from your constituents who are here joining us today. And also just to give you a sense of where the center is located, uh, we have staff in four states. Uh, the bulk are in Nebraska, and we have five of us here in Iowa. We have four staff based in Nevada, which is actually the office I'm calling in from today. And we also have one staff member um, based on her farm in Western Iowa in the Les Hills, and also one in South Dakota and one in Minnesota that comprise our team. And so like I said, we're really just here to have a great conversation, um, hear from your constituents, what they're thinking, and of course, hear your thoughts, your perspectives representative on, on a lot of these important issues and, and give people a chance to ask you some of those important questions. Okay. I would ask for everybody on the call, um, if you do have questions for the representative, we're gonna go in an order of some questions from me from the Center for Rural Affairs. Then we've got some local leaders that are really in your district, kind of boots on the ground, walking the walk that we're really excited to hear from. And then we'll have some opportunity for Q&A with whatever time is left. And so if you do have a question, please go ahead and put it in that Q&A box and we'll get to as many as we can at the end here. Um, and just once again, we know that rural communities are uh, filled with a lot of different folks with different backgrounds. And so we just ask that you um, come with good intentions to this call and this discussion. And we're looking forward to a great conversation and, and respect all around. So thank you all so much. I'd like to start representative. You told us a little bit um, a moment ago, but, but what is your um, interest this session? Kind of what are your policy priorities? What would you like to see accomplished this year? I know we're coming up, I think this is the sixth week of session and it's certainly getting busy. Um, what would you like to see come out of the legislature? Well, you know, right now, you know, the tax plans out there, you know, there's three dueling tax plans and how it uh, affects different segments of our economy or state. Um, I think that's gonna be one important piece because uh, they're, they're talking about how to, uh, adjust for farmers, you know, we don't have 401ks or IRAs, we tend to invest in the farm. So, you know, part of the tax plans are, you know, basically if I rent the farm to my son, then, you know, I can take that money tax-free. It's similar to somebody withdrawing money from their 401k or the IRA. So there's some of that out there. I think that's very, um, I think will be helpful. 
And then also there's a portion, a, a plan out there where uh, not tax uh, pensions and things like that and try and keep uh, people in Iowa. Uh, I do know of people that move out of Iowa because they don't want their retirement stuff being taxed. You know, will that keep people in, especially in our rural communities, you know, they tend to be an older population and, and I'd hate to have them leave or move across the river, at least in Eastern Iowa, just to a taxes. So those are a couple of major things. And then there's always, you know, being on the uh, appropriation side and, and ag and natural resources, you know, you have the, uh, now there, there's been an outbreak of avian influenza in, in Indiana. So hoping that our, you know, we've been working in the past uh, for the department to have a foreign animal disease preparedness program uh, since the last uh, avian, avian influenza <laughs> outbreak. And so hopefully, well, I know they're ready and prepared and, and, and just making sure that stuff would, that would be devastating the Iowa economy. And, you know, on the DNR side, you know, parks, people are uh, new interests in our parks. What, how do we balance you know, making sure they have enough money and then you have a good experience when you come. So that's kind of a mix of where most of my efforts would be uh, this session. Perfect. And that that really transitions into my next question, which was on that taxes piece. I'm sure you've been talking about this possibly a lot <laughs> um, and hearing about this a lot, but we've got to ask, of course, um, there are those three proposals on the table, the House Republicans, the Senate Republicans, and of course, uh, Governor Reynolds' plan. Um, just kind of, do you have any comments on, on those plans or where that might shape out? Um, and specifically, um, the Senate Republicans' proposal as it would fund Natural Resources and Outdoor Recreation Trust Fund, or I will. Do you have any thoughts on that? Well, I'll... Basically, overall, and I'm, I'm, just, I'm biased on this, I'll just put that out there because I've had some input. I like the, the house plan because it's simple. And I think we look forward, a little more forward thinking. Uh, there's some issues with Medicaid that could affect the state four or five years out that we, we need to start preparing for and need to be taken into account because uh, if and when that changes, we have got to pay that. Uh, and we have no choice, so we don't want to put the rest of the services the state has in jeopardy. So I think the, the house, like I said, the house plan, I think is simpler. And I think we tend to be a little more conservative to make sure we don't get into a point we need to deappropriate. Uh, you know, a few years ago, the, you know, the revenue didn't match what numbers we were given. We had a you know, come back here in, in December or January and February and then, you know, deappropriate some funds we had given our departments. And uh, then in, in my mind, I always look at that, you know, amounts to people, we hurt people and, and I don't want to do that. So, you know, that's my uh, summary, quick summary of the three. Uh, when you talk about the three eighths of a Senate, I will, um, I have some concerns with the Senate plan. They deal with the local, in my understanding, if I understand it correctly, uh, the uh, implementing a, a statewide Right now, there's a local option sales tax of one one percent, which you know the cities and stuff vote on, and and there's not the whole state is is involved in that one cent sales tax. So, my understanding is they're implementing that and then taking some of that money for the three eighths of a cent, and you know a three eighths, you know that's you know that man, you know that. I don't know where they come up with enough money to come up with the three eighths of a cent. So. Are the cities and the towns being shorted? Because I know like the city of uh, Cedar Rapids, I think they're using some of that for, you know, flood mitigation and, and streets improvement. And they're, you know, they're, if they're planning on X amount of dollars in the future, you know, and all of a sudden we scoop it, um, we, you know, then that would cause them to raise property taxes to try and make up that deficit. So at the end of the day, you know, what, what, what are the unintended consequences? And, uh, from what I have seen so far, I'm concerned. Um, I've been in favor of the three-eighths of doing it. I think it'd be very beneficial, but we want to make sure we do it right and don't and don't cause other issues. And um, and so that's kind of my concern. I don't quite understand it totally. And to me, it, I haven't been able to follow it totally <laughs> where it all comes from. So I'm afraid it could cause problem unintended consequences. So uh, that, that's my take on that at this time. 
Thank you for your answer there. Um, another topic that's really important to us here at the center is local control and being able to give local leaders and folks on the ground uh, a level of control over decisions in their communities. Um, and a few folks that we're going to hear from later today represent a watershed management authority that's in your district, which is a coalition of counties, cities, and soil and water conservation districts working together to address local water concerns like flooding and things. Um, and I'm curious, what do you see as the role of WMAs, those entities across the state? Well, I like the way they're working. Uh, I mean, the, the, like I said, the partnership. I, I actually, a couple of years ago, thought what tried to change just the name to a partnership, because I think that's what it is. You have interested partners, whether it be the landowners or the cities and the counties involved. And, um, and I think that's the most important part there. I, I think that's the core of, uh, of how we address, you wanna go water quality is, is a broader basis. You know, it doesn't stop at the county lines. And I think that's where the, the, the watershed management authority fits the best with that partnership. So I like them. Um, you know, the question comes, where do they get the money and how they get the money? Uh, you know, it's always, that, 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 it all boils down to that sometime or at the end of the day. Certainly, and I think a lot of your comments um, will be reflected by Lori and Aaron, who are those two folks later, and the idea of them sort of transcending political boundaries and, and actually being on the watershed is really interesting. Um, and finally, our last question from me is related to energy. Um, there's a utility scale solar development project up for approval in your district, and how do you view that, that development, the development of renewable energy in Iowa? And what is the role of the legislature in this whole conversation? Um, that's a tough question um, uh, because you, you, you know, should a landowner be able to do what they want with their land, you know, that local or ultimate local control versus uh, how it affects the people around them. It, it's, it's, it's a um, complex issue. Uh, I know, um, and I think one of, pro I think, um, State policy has gotten behind here. I mean, it seems like the process or the development of these things are, are outpacing where, where the legislature is. Uh, I know in our area, I mean, it's, it's, it's four or five miles from where I live. So, I, I mean, I, when it gets established, I'll be driving through it. And, you know, there's concerns about people in the area. I know there was one... Uh, um, uh, family they, they bought an acreage in the country you know build a beautiful house there and they're going to be surrounded on three sides by solar panels and um, you know what's that you know that wasn't their dream and that wasn't you know how do you it, it's tough it's it <laughs> um it's a tough question one of the but then it, there comes the concern uh, you know uh, do you cover up that prime crop ground? I mean, is there, you know, I, I understand the reason that they pick this, what makes this location ideal is the, the substation, electrical substation that's easy to hook into for the grid. And, uh, but then that's also located in some very prime crop ground, which is a whole lot better than some I farm. So I will switch them. If they put the solar on, I'll take that ground. We'll go acre to acre, but I don't think anybody will take me up on that. So, no, that's a difficult question, how you balance that. And I know our supervisors, um, they've asked me multiple times, you know, they, they want some direction. <laughs> and it's like, um, you know, the it's difficult. I, I, I struggle with it if you, if you haven't figured that out. <laughs> Certainly a, a complex issue, and thank you for taking on that difficult question because, yes, there are a lot of different uh, pieces at play there. Um, that's all from me in terms of questions from the center, at least to start. And so I would love to transition into those local leaders I mentioned earlier. Yep. Uh, I'm just going to share my screen so we can get everybody's name and um, title and organization just out in writing. Um, so we've got Lori and Aaron who are representing um, Limestone Bluffs RCD and the Makokota River Watershed Management Authority. They're going to sort of present together and have some uh, introductions and questions for you. 
And then Lance, who's a mayor in your district, I believe is here with us. And then finally, we'll wrap it up with Phil, um, Executive Director of Clinton County Conservation. Um, so I would love to just turn it over to Lori and, and let's just go ahead and get started with, with our remarks here. Terrific, uh, thanks Kate. Um, I'm Lori Scoble, I'm Executive Director of Limestone Bluffs Resource Conservation and Development. Um, Limestone Bluffs is one of eight RCNDs in the state of Iowa. Uh, we serve six counties in Eastern Iowa and uh, we do a variety of uh, different projects, um, very much like the Center for Rural Affairs. Um, you know, we really like to work and support our rural communities. Um, you know, working as a nonprofit, we kind of focus in on economic development. Uh, we certainly like to support our small business um, projects. Uh, we work in tourism. Um, we support local foods initiatives. And um, really, I think uh, conservation projects um, as a whole. Uh, many of the RCNDs across the state have been instrumental in helping uh, the watershed management authorities uh, form. And um, we're pleased in our um, area to have helped the Makokota River Watershed Management Authority um, get going. And so I'm going to take this opportunity to introduce uh, my coworker, um, Aaron Erickson, who's with the WMA. Hello, and thank you for um, having us today. Um, so a little background for the Maco of the Makokota WMA. It was formed in 2017 um, and, and it spans seven counties with, and we have 34 current members made up of cities, counties and soil and water conservation districts. Um, the watershed is located in Eastern Iowa and encompasses just over a million acres or 1,870 square miles that drain to the Mississippi River. Um, through a partnership with the University of Iowa um, funded by a DNR grant, we were awarded in 2020 the planning and public affairs graduate students um, are helping us complete the phase two or the final version of our watershed management plan. And after the completion of this plan in May, we will be working with communities within our watershed um, to address water concerns um, and demonstrate best practices, best practice techniques for soil health, um, reducing by reducing erosion. Other projects underway or that we've recently completed um, include a mural at a fish hatchery, another in a separate town, um, a water quality design for Camp Courageous that was actually four different designs, um, a water management project for the city of Monticello, and also working at recreating our, our website to feature an interactive tool to be used by communities for future project priority designations. Um, and we're excited to see what the future holds for our organization um, with all of these projects. So a question for you I have, um, as Kate mentioned earlier, that we work closely with the city leaders, soil and water conservation districts and conservation professionals um, to gather technical input and provide community support for projects across our watershed. I'm, as we mentioned earlier, the watershed coordinator hired through a grant, which will end in December, 2022. I am unsure if I'll be able to stay within the WMA any longer after that time. Um, WMA is with stable coordinators who can make local connections, almost always have a result in the strongest WMA work. Um, do you have any visions for keeping watershed coordinators, watershed coordinators especially for w, WMAs like us, um, in their positions and supported? Well, uh, the Secretary Nag and I have had conversations on that very issue because there's those uh, WMA projects in Western Iowa, the same issue is happening that the federal money is running out and the projects aren't totally done or there's still more they can do. So um, conversations are going on to, because you gotta have a front person. And you know, if there's nobody there, you know, it's like having a rudder on a ship. Uh, so that having conversations, I know the secretary is very um, uh, involved. We're trying to come up with an idea uh, or how to do it, how, you know, uh, we're talking about it. And I know Representative Seek from Western Iowa is uh, the biggest advocate for uh, uh, managers. Uh, uh, he's a good friend. So we've had talk. <laughs> he's always talking to me about what we could do. And um, so 
we're trying to come up with something. I know it because it does and kind of it doesn't quite match. And at least uh, as my understanding, when talking with the secretary, you know, um, the grant process, you know, it, it, you know, you you get a grant, but then how do you get it? It so. Uh, we're trying to come up with something. I don't know how better to say it because it is a concern. Like I said, not just you. Uh, it's in Western Iowa, and I, it's it's like I said, the secretary. We're trying to see if there's a way we can, um, like I said, have that center person there, that that coordination or that glue that holds stuff together, which is very important. So uh, uh, that's where we're at at this time. And, uh, hopefully, when it we'll come up with something that can, uh, like I said, uh, at least give an opportunity, a way to. Like I said, continue to fund that. Thank you. Position. Excellent. Thank you all. Uh, Lance, would you like to unmute and, and turn your video on and, and introduce yourself? Yes. I think you guys should hear me now. Um, I'm the mayor of Kelmis, and uh, I guess I just have a brief question um, in regards to infrastructure projects and small communities. Uh, as Kelmus has shrunken slightly, actually significantly since the last <laughs> census, um, one of the things uh, that comes up quite frequently is what will we do to make sure that small towns and schools don't disappear in the next several decades? Are there infrastructure funds available to um, encourage growth in small communities? Because right now, I guess, you know, I can see these other communities that are nearby that are maybe growing and there's lots of money that's needed to keep their schools uh, expanding to, to house all these new students while the schools on the outside uh, of those other schools have plenty of room to take students, but uh, we don't have the population here. Are there simple solutions maybe that uh, can give some money towards smaller towns to, to build some infrastructure for little housing developments to keep our schools full? If, if memory serves me correctly, I thought we passed some legislation either last year or the year before where it, it tiered stuff of some for the, the matches and things like that for smaller communities uh, was less versus, you know, basically try and keep it out of, you know, the, the thing is everything goes to Des Moines. How do we keep money out here? So um, I thought we had done some, especially with housing uh, to, uh, uh, make more available uh, for our smaller communities. But that, what you bring up though, is constantly here is, is, is on the minds of people because uh, if you look, at least I'm gonna say in my caucus, it's heavily uh, rural orientated with, you know, so we're watching out for our people. So that um, hopefully we come up, I know, like I said, it's always part of the conversation that, uh, we make sure we take care of our smaller communities because it, you know, it seems like everything comes to that big sucking sound in the middle of the state and we don't want it, you know, that, that doesn't do Calibus any good. So, but no, it, it, like I said, it's always part of the conversation so, um, out here. I guess, are you aware of a specific um, funding opportunity from the state level that, that goes towards smaller communities that we could look into? Well, I'll check on that housing one. But this year, I'm not, uh, like I said, it's early enough in the process, I'm not aware of anything. But like I said, I know it's always part of the conversation of it. I'll do a little check and get back to you. Like I said, I, I'm positive we, we did something uh, in the matter of housing to uh, help the rural push, at least uh, reserve some of the funding for the rural area. Um, I'll check on that and get back to you, Lance. Yep, I'd appreciate it because, and one last thing I'll say is, you know, there's a lot of people that would like to move back to their rural communities, but there aren't, there aren't houses or places to build. So by default, they have to go to a different community, which becomes your Davenport or somewhere yeah. else. And it's just, there's not enough housing available. It's too costly for towns to do it on their own. So thank you. Yeah. One of the big problems is if, and I don't mean to pick on, uh, Cal must by will. Uh, you know, it, it, I live in DeWitt. If I build a house in DeWitt, you know, the odds are it's worth more next year, but that's not always the case in more of our rural communities. As soon as you get done building it, and, and if you were forced to sell it, you, you it doesn't hold its value or doesn't have the value. So yep. um, we need to do things to, to reverse that.
Thank you both so much. And now we'll hear from Phil, if you'd like to unmute and, and share your question. Oh, sure. Um, I just kind of wanted to start off by giving a little background on uh, county conservation. I'm sure that you know most of us here are aware, but just for anybody else uh, listening in, um, each county has a county conservation board, which uh, you know, and depending on the county, it, you know, will have a different role. But here in Clinton County, we have a you know kind of three different areas that we focus on. We have a recreational areas. And we provide uh, areas for camping and for you know we have cabins and river access. Um, and you know some great areas like that. Uh, we also provide wildlife areas, which offer public hunting um, options for you know people from the county. And also, you know, we've seen a big draw from uh, other areas, people wanting to come and hunt some uh, Iowa deer and pheasants and all those things. Um, and then we also provide environmental education. Um, we have a great uh, naturalist program here, where you know we do uh, field trips uh, to our parks and wildlife areas. We have a couple of nature centers that, you know, we're have been able to provide to the people here. And uh, we're also able to go into the schools and, you know, able to help, uh, you know, educate people about uh, um, conservation and about the environment. Um, and with that, I think, you know, we had already kind of talked a little bit about when, when earlier we had mentioned tax reform. Um, you know, the uh, Iowa Natural Resource and Outdoor Rec uh, Trust Fund and, you know, the, how that's, you know, something that's being discussed as well. And, you know, I wanted to talk a little bit about, you know, REAP, um, which is, you know, a part of that. And I also wanted to thank uh, Representative Momsen for uh, attending the uh, REAP assembly, uh, you know, a couple months ago back at, at the Hurstville Nature Center there in Maquoketa. And, you know, I really appreciated seeing him there. And, you know, being able to, you know, have his input there. Um, you know, but REAP is, is really important to not just to county conservation, but also to a lot of these small communities like, uh, you know, like Calamus and, you know, uh, DeWitt and these other areas there, you know, we're able to use funds from REAP to, um, you know, provide improvements to, you know, a lot of our areas and, you know, we're able to you know, for instance, uh, last year we used uh, some of funds from REAP to uh, update one of our nature centers and to kind of provide a community room area addition to our nature center. Do you need this? Uh, um, oh, sorry, Mom. Anyway, I guess my question is just kind of coming back to I to the uh, to the outdoor rec trust. Um, you know, with the tax reform, you know, that has kind of become a, a big topic. And, you know, I was wondering how, how we can go about funding, you know, the trust, I mean, through some of these different options, um, the, through these different tax reforms, because I mean, that, you know, that can provide a lot of relief for, you know, county conservation boards and for other small, you know, uh, communities, you know, they're able to apply for these grants and they're able to get funding, um, you know, and especially in rural areas that, you know, funding could be really important through things like REAP because, you know, we may not have, you know, like if you go to Polk County, they are, they have a lot of different organizations there that are like, oh yeah, we'll throw a million dollars to whatever project is comes up. So I just wondering uh, how we can look at, you know, getting that funding, I guess, and, and what options there are, so. No, I agree with you. And that's why, you know, a couple of years ago, the governor had, um, I can't remember what she called the program, but um, it basically included the, the funding for REAP or raising a penny sales tax. So, uh, and then that COVID hit and everything changed. And I, I was a little disappointed she didn't bring that back. And, and, and so we could have addressed that issue with the, the REAP program or the, the I will program overall. So um, that, it, that's a not a tough question. I mean, it's an easy question. Easy question, and money money doesn't answer. Money doesn't fix. So, uh, and that, and that's kind of the problem out here, and, or one of the, the the challenges out here how you how you fund stuff. Because um, I know well, like through REAP, a certain percentage goes to your county conservation, and then it then there's tiered on 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 parks and things like that that can get grants and money by the size of the town. 
uh, that saves money for in different funding levels or match levels. So, um, uh, I would, well, I hate to say this because you're going to get on, you got to keep on your legislature <laughs> for a while. <laughs> But we'll we'll see what comes up. Like I said, I, I don't know where where that that uh, you know, especially with the you know with the tax packages, what's going to come out. Um, I would like to see reap or not reap. The I will or the three eighths funded, but I want to make sure it's it's done right and not something that, like I said, uh, a place like uh, uh, Lance comes back and said you took money away, you gave me money and put it in my right pocket, but then you took it out of my left pocket. So, uh, and we gotta be careful we don't do things like that. Yeah, thank you, thank you. I, I, I understand. Oh, no, I mean, is this somebody in here? Just, just excuse me a second. No, I'm, I'm sorry, I mean, I thought. No, I, I didn't know. My this. schedule says that I'm supposed to be here, but. No, I can move. Well, no, this would be a separate So you would you would there be more than just you here. So I'm probably in the wrong place. No, no, I I don't move. I'm I'm leaving. I'm not going to stay. I'm supposed to be. It's supposed no. to be in 11:37. But if it's scheduled in here, I got to move. I think my schedule is probably wrong. Well, kick me out when you have to. I'll, I'll move. Really go see if I can find out I thought I found a place to hide. Now everybody's finding me. So okay, I'm back. I'm sorry. You are totally fine. If we need to move, we can we can chat a little more amongst ourselves or something. Well, too. like I said, I can just pick up and leave if I have to here. And I might have to I might get stuff ready. Okay, next. <laughs> Thank you to the four of you again for joining us. I just want to make sure are there any questions from the four of you or from you, Representative, any other comments before we transition anything that's been discussed so far? I just wanted okay. to highlight the things that we've been talking about here really are all related to, um, you know, rural communities and, and the vitality of our areas. And, you know, having um, these funding opportunities for the environment, for special projects, for uh, watershed groups, for parks and rec, for housing, you know, all of those add uh, to that quality of life component that will help encourage um, our uh, talent pools to be returning to our small communities. And that's really what we're looking at, I think, in rural Iowa, is being able to have that infrastructure for the total package um, to help keep our um, smaller communities vibrant. So thank you for your work on that. No, I agree. Excellent, thank you, Lori. I think that was a perfect summary of everything we've discussed so far. Um, I'd love to use the rest of this time um, for the questions from your constituents and the folks on the call here today. Um, and I'm looking through the Q&A and we've got quite a range and so we'll get to as many as we can. Um, a few of them, if you don't hear me read it exactly, I might be kind of combining a few that have similar um, content. But we'll start with one from Mike, um, which is about your soil health bill representative. I believe that was introduced last session and I think he's just curious uh, what is the status of that? What, do you have any plans with that this session? Uh, no, I don't plan on reintroducing it. Um, uh, well, there was some opposition that came up that was uh, on it. Um, and those hurdles are still here. So I, I don't, and so uh, the time, I think the timing will be better. Uh, well, I'm going to, be honest next year, just because I think some of those hurdles be removed. Uh, but I still think it's an important conversation. I think I think that's the next step or the next piece of the puzzle when we talk water quality. Because uh, if you um, you know uh, if you deal with the soil health and improve soil health, that improves the water quality and it all fits together. So to me, that's the next step we need to go there. But in regards to that bill, like I said, then I'm playing politics here. Uh, the politics aren't quite right for it right now. And, and instead of uh, beating my head against the wall, uh, I, I think timing would be much uh, better next year. Um, the, the issue hasn't died or I, I haven't lost enthusiasm for it. It's just, um, like I said, I, I'm playing politics with it. And I just, it's just that simple. certainly can understand that. And thank you for your answer there. Um, this one is from Kay. And 
she says, I realize this is a Senate bill. And as I just read it quickly, I think she's talking about um, it's a Senate study bill at this time. And the number is like 3134. Don't quote me on that. But it's in the Senate and, and the representative might not be familiar with it, but it seems like a bad <laughs> idea. <laughs> give, it, give it a shot here. I'll see if I've heard of it or not. Or Yes, I, I think she gives a little more detail here um, that might help. Um, to curtail DNR and county conservation. Oh, is there a meeting? Is there a sub in here? What, 10 minutes? Okay, I got 10 minutes. All right, we can do that. We can do that. Maybe one or two more questions. Then. Okay, go ahead. I'm... All right. So I'll just start over. So this is yep. a study bill. Um, you may not be familiar, but if, if you've heard of it, um, she says it could curtail DNR and county conservation board's ability to acquire land at market rates. There is land in a two-year floodplain that is unsuitable for row crop production. The state should not put restrictions on local control between willing sellers. So I guess the first question is, are you familiar with what she's talking about? And if so, do you have any thoughts? I, I'm not familiar with that bill, but uh, that type of legislation, I, I, it comes up every session, oh, excuse me, every session. So um, I would, um, I, I don't personally see it going anywhere. Uh, because I know when you talk with like the DNR, uh, like I said, they try very hard to um, purchase what you know what it basically what makes a good add-on to to their facilities or their parks and stuff. So, but that just every year pops up. Um, Thank you, and and I think for our last question before we get to some final thoughts. Um, there's a theme in the Q&A about eminent domain. So I'm gonna to try to combine a few of those questions together. Um, one is relating to um, carbon pipeline. One is, I believe, relating to solar. Uh, so I guess just any any thoughts um, on eminent domain and maybe the role of the legislature? Uh, that's that's a tough question, um, especially with the carbon, carbon pipelines. I know in the Clinton County area, um, there was some public hearings on that one company put on and uh, uh, they are since not coming to Clinton County. And uh, I, my understanding was they use eminent domain and I had meetings with another company <laughs> that is, we're gonna work with uh, ADM. And uh, they told me they, they only work with willing sellers and don't, uh, and don't use eminent domain. So um, I think a lot of it is the company and how willing they are to uh, work with people or move the line and find willing sellers, um, which I, I think should be done as much as possible. Uh, but then you have to weigh that on uh, what's good, you know, what's good for society. I mean, it's, um, I, I'm sure like an interstate 80, there's some people that didn't want, uh, didn't want to lose their farm or land to interstate 80, but in the end, you know, is it, is it a greater benefit like I said, that's a tough issue. Um, I know they're struggling with it here at the Capitol. And I'll go back to an earlier answer I gave. I think public policy has kind of gotten behind where the industry and things are going. And we need to catch up to give some direction here. And, and so uh, the landowners at least have some certainty as long and as well as the companies that are trying to uh, do projects like this. So they kind of know what, what their limitations are. So um, I know I, you know, our farm has been in the family for years. It's a century farm, you know, and I would, you know, it would hurt <laughs> to have somebody come in and, 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 you know, just say, Hey, guess what I get to do. And so there is that, that struggle that, that, that I fully understand people to have. And, um, it's a tough one. It's 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 one of those. It's hard to decide. Well, thank you for sharing your thoughts on that. And and once again, we have had some tough questions here today, and we appreciate you tackling them. Um, any last comments you'd like to just kind of close on, or anything um, you haven't shared yet that you'd like to with this group? <laughs> well, I think um, we're you know when it comes to water quality and soil health and all those issues of. So we're, we're, we're at a transitional spot. And, uh, you know, right now, a lot of that, you know, when it comes, especially with the uh, water quality issues, it's like, who's gonna pay? You know, I, 
I'll put cover crops in if you pay me. I'll put uh, buffer strips in it, but who's going to pay me because there's no benefit. So, and uh, I think right now we, and that's why I was so interested in the soil health part, because I think if we can show a benefit of some of these same practices that improve the soil health, which would have an economic benefit, you know, to me, the, the landowner or, or producer, then then I, then I'm not coming to the state, you know, I'll do it if you pay me, I'll do it because it makes me money or it, it makes, you know, and then I think when you would, this transition uh, takes place, then I think you'll see uh, extraordinary gains when basically there is a, a you, know, you know, I hate to say it, but money talks. And like I said, when, when, when it benefits me or I can show that, uh, you know, either through regenerative, regenerative ag or something of that nature, you know, if there's a direct benefit to the producer or even like I said, the landlord, if they feel that that makes their farm better for them by having me do certain practices, you know, there's an economic benefit. And, and then we won't, all, we won't be so dependent on the state for money because it'll, it'll be a self you know, generating or self-proclaiming situation. So I, I think we're at that point, we're kind of teetering between, you know, cause now, you know, we're coming to the money, the state for money, we need grant through grant money or we need this, but you know, if, if I find out by me doing these things, I get more money, you know, just from the marketplace, well then um, I'm crazy not to do it because it benefits me. So I, I think we're at that position, how we, you know, um, like I said, I think we're at a tr transitional place here, and I, I'm hoping to see that transform and, and move away from uh, sitting here with my hand out so that you pay me that, you know, I, I'm doing it because it, it's mutually beneficial for me financially. So I think we're at that point here, and how we, how we do that will be the interesting part. All righty. Well, thank you again, Representative, for carving out some time for us today. And, and we had a great group. I think we had almost 40 folks on the call at one point and lots of good questions and discussion. So thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you again, Representative. And if there are no further comments, I think we can uh, wrap it up here and, and take an earlier lunch. Yeah, thank you. Like I said, I, I think I'm going to get kicked out. <laughs> thank you again. All righty. Thanks so much, everyone. Yep. Yeah.